Much appreciate the Jubilation Ringers visiting us here at 945 service. Fantastic. We don't always get the Jubilation Ringers at, uh, at our Blue Jean service, and they agreed to come this morning and play. What a great song. Jesus loves Anybody recognize that song? What was it? Jesus loves me. How many of you all know that song? How many of you heard that song when you were a child? For some people, it's the very first song maybe they ever learned to sing. How many of you ever sung that to your own child or maybe your own grandchild? Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me. So it's a great, great song. Simple, but isn't that what we really want to know underneath it all? I mean, through all of the music, through all the preaching, through all the liturgy of the church, through all the stuff that we do on Sunday mornings and in Sunday school and in small groups, isn't that really what we want to know underneath all that, that Jesus loves us? Jesus loves me. That's what gives me hope, not only for this life, but for the life that is to come. Underneath all the other trappings of the church, underneath all the other wonderful things that happen in the church, I think that's what people really want to know. Jesus loves me. And friends, I would say, too, that uh, the message of the church, of all the things that we could share with our world, that is one of the, I mean, I don't know what else we can give the world, right? Let them know that Jesus loves them, that, that God loved the world so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, not just for me and not just for you, but for every man, woman, and child since that time and before that time and living right now and that person right next to you and the person that lives in your home with you and the person that you go to work with every day or to school every day, Jesus loves us. Amen? Karl Barth is one of the famous uh, theologians of the 20th century. He was a brilliant guy and you know he could, he could describe the faith in a million different ways, but he was asked one time to describe his faith in one sentence, all right? Now, this is a, the, a, a well-trained, one of the top-tier theologians in the world asked to describe his understanding, his belief in Christianity in one sentence. If someone asked you that, what would you say in one sentence? Well, here's what he said. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It, it, it all kind of comes down to this. And this morning uh, on World Communion Sunday, we're moving in this series we've started some time ago, Knowing, Loving, and Serving God, looking together at the love of God, the love of God for me and for you and for all the world. And we want to share this morning from 1 John chapter 4. And this section uh, in the Bible is, uh, has a subtitle, at least in the New Revised Standard Version, God is Love. I'm going to be reading from 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 through 16. You can follow along on the big screen or, you know, highlight it in your own Bible. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God. And God abides in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Here in this fourth chapter of, the, of 1 John, twice we hear that phrase, that wonderful phrase of Scripture, God is love. Will you say that with me? God is love. One more time, say it like you mean it. God is love. Will you turn to your neighbor in case, in case they're tempted to forget? Tell them, God is love. Turn to your other neighbor. Remind them, they need to hear it. God is love is love and if we don't get anything accomplished today besides that it's a good morning right because god is love and we don't ever want to forget that god is love and so what can we say very simply about the love of god as we begin our journey uh, looking at god's love together first of all we can say that god does not love you out of obligation remember that god's love for you is not an, a, an obligatory kind of love God didn't need us. God didn't create us because God had to do that. 
we believe in something called the Trinity. God was complete in and of himself, and he was his own family. I mean, he, he wasn't lonely out in deep space or something. God created us because he could love us, and because it's his very nature to love, he is love. You were created purely, not out of obligation, out of love. God does not love you as an obligation. Now, uh, don't raise your hand for this. I'll just confess for everyone. <laughs> Are there some people, I bet there's some people in your life that you're trying to love right now out of obligation because uh, maybe they're related to you. <laughs> Or, or, or maybe they're a friend, you, don't want, you really don't want to lose them. Or, or, or maybe it's a neighbor, and because you're a Christian, and you're just try, you feel obligated to try to love that person. Again, don't raise your hand. Uh, we've all been there. But I want you to hear this morning loudly and clearly, God does not love you like that. God does not love you out of obligation. It's not a burden for God to love you, because God is love. Will you say that with me again? God is love. And secondly, we want to remember, God doesn't love us out of obligation, and also God's love for you is not resentful. Again, don't raise your hand. I'll confess for all of us this morning because we're human beings. Sometimes our love as human beings is a little resentful, isn't it? I mean, we might not articulate it quite like that. We might not tell someone, hey, I resent loving you, but what we do, whether we say it or not, in our heart we say, I love you, but. <laughs> or I love you, but if you do that again, I probably won't. Right? Or, you know, I, I, I love you as far as it goes, but I'm not really happy about it. God's love for you is not resentful. God does not love you and, and, and resent it the whole time because, because of what you've done or, or who you are. God loves you not because of who you are. God loves you because of who he is. He loves you, and his love for you is not resentful. Uh, I'll tell a couple of stories this morning. One was with a young man, a young adult, serving on a church. He'd been in, he's been in a church for a long time. The, neither one of these folks, by the way, are related to this local church. Some other uh, conversations I've had over the last couple weeks. This man does serve, young man serves on a staff, and he's a Christian, and he gets up and goes to church every Sunday. He even serves in the church and, and receives a paycheck for that. But down deep inside, he shared with me the other day that he knows who he is sort of on the inside. And, and he feels like God has forgiven him, but he's not sure how long that forgiveness is going to last. He's living his life as if one day God's going to get so fed up and, and remember all the stuff that he's done in his past that someday, God's being you know, patient now, but someday God's going to put the hammer down on him. Anybody? Well, don't raise your hand. <laughs> don't raise, let me confess for all of us this morning. Sometimes we think God's love is like that. The Scripture tells us that when we confess our sins, God separates us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. Can anybody tell me how far that is? I don't, it's a long way. I don't know exactly, but I know that the two never meet. God throws, a, another image I love in the scripture is that God throws our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. And God's not just, you know, sort of standing over us, loving us, but holding this thing over our head like we often do to each other. And it's not this thing that, that you know, our sin is not this thing that God sweeps under the rug and covers it up, but it's still there. And if, you know, and whenever he wants to, he can, you know, pull it out and throw it in our face. God's love is not like that. When God, when God forgives us, he takes the trash out. <laughs> and it's gone, right? It's gone. God's love for you and for me is not resentful. God does not love us reluctantly. Third, God does not love us reluctantly sometimes our love for each other is a little reluctant we might say oh you know you burned me once and so i'll try to love you a little bit but i'm gonna play my cards pretty close here because i don't want to get burned again we get that we all get that now don't raise your hand <laughs> i can confess for all of us because every one of us has been in a situation where we felt like we had to love like 
that. God's love is not like that. God does not love you reluctantly. Another conversation I had was with a woman. This, this time it was a middle-aged woman. Uh, not, I get the feeling she wasn't really a part of a church, but she was sort of on the edge of several different congregations and sort of hopped around going to various congregations. Um, she was a same-sex attracted uh, middle-aged woman who was just trying to kind of find her way in life. And the question that was asked was, do you think God could really love someone like me? We know the answer to that. And we know the answer to that not because of who she is, but because of who God is. The answer, of course, is yes. God loves you. God loves me. God loves every one of us because that is who God is. God is love. Say it with me. God is love. God loves you because God is is love. If that's some, some of the things that God's love is not, we also know from Scripture some of the things that God's love is. God's love is self-giving. That's what the cross is all about. That's why the cross is the central symbol of the Christian faith. It reminds us of how far God will go to express God's love for you and me, all the way to the cross. God's love is, is not just a concept, it's, it's a reality, it's as real as the cross, it's self-giving. That's why, you know, in John 3, 16 and 17, maybe some of the most well-loved verses in the whole Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God's love is self-giving. God's love is personal. And I hope you'll hear that this morning as we gather with millions of Christians all over the world. We know that God's love is for the world, right? Scripture tells us that. But God's love is not only for all the world. God's love is for you. God's love is for you personally. And it's that personal love of God that changes us on the inside. It's that personal love of God when we receive and accept the love that Christ has for us that transforms us on the inside, that moves God's love in our lives from this, this concept that we have in our mind down to this experience we have in our hearts. If you've never said yes to God's love, I hope you will this morning when we come for communion at this table. If you've never said yes to, to God's love, if you've never said yes to God's personal love for you, if you've never taken the work of the cross personally for you as well as for the world, I hope you will today. This is why the Apostle Paul can say in Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, sometimes it's, uh, you know, God will use anything to get our attention, I believe, uh, and, and can use anything to get our attention. Pastor uh, Jamie and uh, Pastor Stephen and some of the, we were talking on Monday, talking about this uh, sermon on the love of God, and we agreed that sometimes God's love makes us a little uncomfortable. I can remember a time in my life when I began to believe that there was a God, but the more I began to believe there was a God, the more uncomfortable I became because I knew that there were some things in my life that were not right. If this God of the Bible really exists, then I need to make some chance. There's, you know, I got to do something to make my life right with this God who created me. And so I, I think that's the root of that scripture that says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, the, of wisdom. It, it, it may be the beginning of wisdom, but it's not the end, right? Because it's God's, in J, I love the way Pastor Jamie said it. He said it was the fear of God that made me recognize my need, but it was God's love that transformed me. Amen? I think so many of us can testify to that. God's love never changes. Scripture says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God loved you when you came out of the womb. God loved you in those awkward years of, of growing up. Uh, God loved you when you stole out of the cookie jar. God loved you as a young adult. God loves you as an adult, and God will continue to love you till your last day on earth, and then God's love will follow you and welcome you into a new home in heaven. Isn't that good news? God's love for you never changes. Whatever your past, whatever you think your future is going to be, God's love is for you 
this morning. Jesus Christ came to this world because God loves us. And this morning we remember that God's love is not just a concept, it's very real. God's love is as real as the cross of Jesus Christ, blood on that cross. God's love is as real as the bread and the juice of communion that we have before us that we'll be tasting in just a few minutes. God's love is real for each of us. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples, those disciples he loved very much. He gave new meaning to the bread when he broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body given for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for this bread and juice and pray that they might be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Oh God, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 